Onk Live Insights is a video editorial program produced by Onk Live. Most of the success in myeloma in the past two decades has been almost serendipitous in that the introduction of imits, firstly with thalidomide, and then the observation that myeloma cells were sensitive to proteasome inhibitors is really treating plasma cells rather than the specific genetic abnormalities that we know exist in myeloma. And you could say exactly the same thing for high dose alkylating therapy. So high dose therapy, imids, proteasome inhibitors are not in any way targeted. They're really exploiting plasma cell biology. So it's only recently that the idea that we could target more specifically has come into our thoughts. And that may be because there is now the realization that the presently available therapy is not curative and we need to move on and exploit new ideas. It's very evident, for example, that a large proportion of patients harbor disease with mutations in the RASMAP kinase pathway. It's been thought that perhaps 40 to 50% of patients have got activated mutations in that pathway. There's new evidence suggesting this may be 60%, and we have evidence which we hope to present at some stage in the near future, suggesting that maybe up to 80% of patients have activating mutations in that pathway. And to me, that provides a very strong rationale to look at specific inhibitors of that pathway. So targeted therapies against MEC. Uh, there are now drugs in development which inhibit ERK. So all of these agents, I think, should be explored in a targeted fashion. The other pathway which I think is exceedingly important is the PI3K AKT pathway. And we know that about 50% of patients have got constitutive activation of that pathway with phosphorylated AKT present. This is in the context of very few patients having an activating mutation in the pathway. So the pathogenesis of that is unclear, but there's certainly evidence preclinically that AKT inhibitors can be effective and we now have evidence from early phase trials that a significant minority of patients can achieve very durable responses to single agent AKT inhibitors. So I think these two targeted therapies offer a lot of promise and need to be fully exploited in the experimental context to define who may respond best to them. With our understanding of the disease demonstrating that there is marked intraclonal heterogeneity. The concept that you might be able to treat all of the different clones with a single agent really doesn't make any sense. So you'd have to postulate that we need a platform which may be broadly effective against plasma cells, hence the uh, belief that a proteasome inhibitor imid-based backbone therapy may have utility. And then it may be possible to add into that platform more selected therapies based on what we know about the biology of particular patients' disease. So for example, if we had abnormalities in the RASMAP kinase pathway, we may add in a MEC or an ERK inhibitor to a proteasome inhibitor imid backbone. Conversely, we may add in an AKT inhibitor to the same backbone in patients that overexpress phospho-AKT. And there are clearly going to be other examples of pathways which are aberrantly activated, which we're going to be able to target and therefore add into a broad, uh, effective backbone to try and cover all of the clones present in a particular patient. Ixasomib is a second generation proteasome inhibitor. It's a boronic proteasome inhibitor of oral administration. That uh, it has been uh, evaluated in the treatment of relapse and refractory myeloma patients. It represents another PI in addition to bortezomib, carfilzomib, oprosomib, and marisomib. What does Ixasomib represent for myeloma patients? Now at the present time, we have results coming from some phase one, two trials. 
conducted in relapsed and refractory myeloma patients and also in newly diagnosed myeloma patients. And we know that ixazomib is effective when it is given just once per week, three weeks on, one week off. Ixazomib is effective in relapsed and refractory myeloma patients even in patients who have been previously exposed to bortezomib, lenalidomide, and even also to the second generation proteasome inhibitors such as carfilzomib. But from my point of view, we need to wait to know the results of the randomized trials comparing, for example, IRD versus RD. The results of this trial will be probably presented at the next ASH meeting in December of this year. And uh, this uh, will be exciting because uh, if IRT is superior to RD, we will have a new standard of care for the treatment of relapsed and refractory myeloma patients. But ixazomib has been also evaluated in newly diagnosed myeloma patients. And again, this combination is effective, resulting in approximately 30% of complete response rate. And for me, it's very interesting also the evaluation of ixazomib as part of the maintenance therapy because a small group of patients in this uh, trial conducted in the upfront setting received ixazomib as part of the maintenance therapy as single agent. And uh, what uh, we have observed is that uh, a significant proportion of patients, almost half of the patients, were able to improve the quality of the response after maintenance with ixazomib. So I think the future is very exciting as we move forward. Obviously, we now have two proteasome inhibitors with uh, Velcade and Carfilzomib. We have two imids with lenalidomide and pomalidomide, and now Feridac as well with a new class of drugs. So I think all these are very exciting. And as we move forward uh, in the next six months, I think we'll see additional therapeutics that are added uh, to our current options, uh, including two different monoclonal antibodies. And I think it's important to highlight there's uh, different uh, and they're unique in their mechanism of action with different targets. So elotuzumab uh, will hopefully be available to patients in the U.S. in the next six months, uh, which targets SLAMF7, and daratumumab, which is a second monoclonal antibody, uh, which targets CD38, hopefully also be available to patients in the next six months as well. They both work in very different ways, um, and very, very exciting data. I think those are going to be practice changing as we move forward in the future. What we see with elotuzumab is a very nice combination uh, data with lenalidomide based on the Eloquent2 data. Um, as well as in some data with a uh, phase two trial in combination with bortezomib. Uh, the daratumumab data that we see there uh, shows very nice single agent activity in the later lines of therapy with approximately 30% response rate. Uh, so I think that's a very nice uh, option for patients as well. And that field is gonna evolve very quickly as well as we get more combination data to really understand how can we combine it with lenalidomide, what's the duration of response, and progression-free survival as you combine it with different imids or proteasome inhibitors. So I think that's going to evolve very rapidly over the next several years, but I think it's exciting that now that our patients will have other options um, with elotuzumab and daratumumab, which are both very active drugs um, in combination with lenalidomide or as a single agent. Beyond uh, some of our other therapies that are, you'll be hearing about um, at ASH, including exazomib and other small molecules, and then monoclonal, specifically elotuzumab and daratumumab, I think you're going to hear a lot more about immunotherapy uh, coming at ASH um, and then in the next several years. You'll hear about PD-1 and inhibiting PD-1, which is, a, I think, a big story, uh, the pembrolizumab. Uh, you'll see some data at ASH regarding this, and there's been a nice uh, amount of data now uh, showing the benefit of PD-1 and targeting immunotherapy uh, or using immunotherapy in solid tumors and Hodgkin's disease over the last several years. I think that's going to be kind of rapidly integrated into the myeloma space, um, at least in clinical trials. And so we're going to see a lot more data coming with uh, cellular therapy, CAR T cell therapy, vaccines, and immunotherapy over the next kind of three to five years. And I think this will start, and you'll see some nice data at ASH potentially um, as well. So.